We are the Childhood Collective, and we have helped thousands of overwhelmed parents find joy and confidence in raising their child with ADHD. I'm Katie, a speech-language pathologist. And I'm Lori. And I'm Mallory, and we're both child psychologists. We combine the science of ADHD with the compassion of moms and bring you practical tools you can start using today. So hit subscribe and let's help your family shine with ADHD. All at us for a while, you know that we love to talk about ways to support ADHD brains at home and school. It's basically our favorite topic. It definitely is. Last week, we were brainstorming different topics for the podcast, and we realized that we need to do an episode to talk about the basics of ADHD. So that's what we're going to do today. Woohoo! <laughs> so, so maybe you're new to the ADHD world, or maybe you haven't even gotten a diagnosis yet, or maybe your child has had their ADHD diagnosis for a long time now. Wherever you're coming from, there is going to be something for you in this episode. Definitely. And today, I'm going to be asking Lori and Mallory all the questions. Before we get started, I just want to brag about them for a quick minute. In case you didn't know, Lori and Mallory are both child psychologists, and they both have extensive backgrounds in evaluations, which often includes evaluating for things like ADHD. And Lori currently has a practice in Scottsdale, Arizona, where we live, where it's currently very hot. (laughs) So ladies, let's dive in. Let's do it. So I want to start with some of the basics. So our first question is, what is ADHD? What does it stand for? And for parents who are new to the diagnosis, what does ADHD really mean? That is a great question. Pretty much everyone's heard of ADHD before, but not everyone might know what it stands for. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. ADHD is one of the most common neurodevelopmental conditions, but it's really misunderstood. And I think one of the reasons is that it's called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. (laughs) Seriously, I don't know who came up with that, but it's a little misleading. And we've heard so many um, people saying lately the name needs to change. And, um, you know, we would agree with that. It's not the best name for the diagnosis, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And we would have to rename the Shining with ADHD podcast. So, which would be difficult. Right. So, hopefully, so. they don't change it anytime <laughs> soon. But it would be nice to have a name that actually describes more about what it is. Cause I feel like hyperactivity disorder, everybody thinks of like the little kindergarten boy just kind of running circles around the classroom and can't sit down at circle time. And, um, that can definitely be the case, but as we're about to learn, there's there's so much more to it and so much more yeah. complexity. Absolutely. And so when it comes down to it, ADHD is kind of this brain-based difference. ADHD brains are literally, they're firing differently. They're growing and developing differently. We're learning more about the ADHD brains, but we believe that the neurotransmitters in the ADHD brain are working differently. And a lot of what it comes down to is really the frontal lobe of your child's brain or maybe your brain if you have ADHD. The frontal lobe is underactive. And this impacts most notably what uh, we talk about here a lot, executive functioning, Um, things like being able to focus on boring tasks, um, stay organized, um, manage impulses, plan ahead, think about the future, so many different things that it really, that executive functioning um, is responsible for. And a question that we get a lot is, um, will my child always have ADHD? Are they growing, going to grow out of this over time? And we have some research to show that over time, um, some areas of challenge can get easier. This doesn't necessarily mean that someone is growing out of ADHD or that someone no longer has ADHD or that they never had ADHD. But as the brain develops, there may be some things that get easier. Some things may no longer be challenging. And we know that with the right supports, kids and adults both can learn about their brain. They can learn strategies and tools that support their unique brain and the way their brain likes to do things. So things can get easier. And we really know that with the right support, people with ADHD can learn to manage those 
challenges, they can lean into their strengths, and they can live very happy and successful lives, which we know um, parents want that reassurance. We get that question all the time. My child just got a diagnosis of ADHD. Like, can they live a happy and successful life? And the answer is yes, we do see that time and time again. These kids can. They have so many strengths with the right supports. They can do that. Which is why we're here is to give you all the strategies and supports really early on with our kids so that um, they can lead amazing, successful lives. And it doesn't change the fact that they have ADHD, but again, with the right supports, um, you know, we can see them do amazing things later on. Absolutely, I love the way that you described it, that things that it can change over time. So some things are going to get easier. Honestly, some things might get more challenging, but I think that's also really true for like every parent and every kid. Right. And so Mm -hmm. there's, I don't know, for me, it's like, there's some reassurance there too. Like, you know, we talked about this on another episode recently, but this too shall pass, right? Like the things that are really challenging can, can get easier over time. So that's Mm -hmm. really good to hear. Yeah. And I always think of like, you know, school is not, you know, you have to learn all these things through elementary and middle and high school that your kids aren't really necessarily interested in. Like I hated doing homework and I didn't want to be in school. And then when I got to college, I loved psychology and I was driven and passionate for that. Um, And so my motivation and interest like completely changed the way I did schoolwork and, and my motivation to get homework done and things like that. Um, So I know that, you you know, getting through these years of school can be really, really challenging because your kids are having to do a lot of things that they're not necessarily interested in. As they get older, they can focus on those areas that they're passionate about. And it does make a huge difference. Definitely. I I totally hear you. So when we think about Um, the different types of ADHD. I know there are three different types of ADHD. So maybe tell us a little bit more about that. What are the different, what different presentations might parents be seeing? Yeah. So there are three different types of ADHD. And a lot of people don't hear about the first one, which is predominantly inattentive presentation. So this is where parents that I talk to Um, sometimes when we get done with our parent interview, like I just had this happen with a family where they're reporting things like their kids getting disorganized or they're not finishing tasks at home. They're getting distracted easily, um, during their morning routines, or they have to have like lots of reminders and prompting. Um, it's almost like you're talking to them and they're not not even listening to you because they're just not focused on that. They're focused on something else. Um, Really hard time um, listening to instructions and following through on instructions. Um, And parents don't necessarily think of ADHD because in their minds, they're thinking of, well, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's very confusing because my child isn't hyperactive. A lot of times parents will describe their kids as underactive, like they're they're, you know, tend to be slower at processing things and they're not running around and they're not hyperactive. So it can just be very confusing when I might suggest, hey, I think we need to do more testing Mm -hmm. on ADHD. And I have to give that explanation of there are kids with predominantly inattentive presentation. And I think you can correct me if this is wrong, Lori, but I feel like there's a lot of times we see that presentation in girls, not always, but because of that, it's often a delayed diagnosis because when you have the yes. little person that's kind of just like running really fast and talking a lot and jumping and, you know, that kind of what you think of for ADHD, those kids get picked up a lot sooner where the inattentive kids often look like they're paying attention and they are yeah. quiet in class. You know, they're maybe distracted internally, but they're not showing that as visibly to the teacher. And so those kids, it can be harder to track down. And a lot of times it'll be later, like third, fourth grade, because that's when the complexity of the schoolwork gets a lot harder and that inattention becomes more obvious. Yeah. And sometimes it's not until middle school or high school when, again, our kids are transitioning from one class to another and they have five different classes and homework to keep track of, and they don't have the executive functioning skills to manage that. And now all of a sudden we have missing tons of missing assignments. We have 
homework stuffed in backpacks that's not getting turned in. Um, you know, again, many, many teachers aren't necessarily seeing that, like you said, Katie, because those kids aren't acting out and they're not disrupting the classroom. They kind of just fly under the radar, right? And you're correct that many of many of the times it's girls. Um, that tends to be more of the presentation that we see in girls with ADHD. Um, but again, I had I had a IEP meeting with a family um, not too long ago, and it was a boy. And the teacher was like, "I don't see ADHD, but he doesn't. He has a really hard time starting." his schoolwork in class and he's he's got tons of missing assignments and he's forgetting to turn stuff in. And so she kind of listed like a lot of those inattentive symptoms <laughs> of ADHD. Yeah. But again, that teacher wasn't really connecting that to um, those are ADHD symptoms. So it's not, you know, and it's not just families that come in confused. A lot of times we're having to explain that to school staff because they're kind of looking for those hyperactive, impulsive kids. Um, and again, a lot of our kids don't necessarily show those symptoms. Over the past year, my oldest has really struggled with anxiety, especially at night. As soon as it was time for sleep, she'd be crying for me to stay and worrying about all the things. I was talking to another therapist about our bedtime battles, and she said the Zenimal, a screen-free meditation device, had been a game changer for her daughter with ADHD and anxiety. I immediately purchased the Zenimal and can confidently say it was the best tool to help my daughter get better sleep. She was able to fall asleep an hour earlier using it. Yes, it's actually really helped my kids to be able to calm their busy bodies at night. What we love about the Zenimal is that it combines two of our favorite bedtime recommendations using a relaxation strategy and removing screens from the bedroom. The Zenimal is an adorable, screen-free turtle with nine guided meditations your kids can choose from. And our absolute favorite part of the Zenimal is that every meditation ends with the most important message, you're a good kid. To grab your own Zenimal and get your child and yourself some better sleep, head to Zenimals.com and use our code TCC for a discount. You can also find the link in the show notes. The other presentation is predominantly hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Um, so sometimes what can happen is, and, and what I'll see is some kids do have some of those inattentive symptoms. They're just not the predominant thing that teachers are seeing. Or we have some kids who really love school. They're really good at it. They love learning. They're super passionate about it. And so they are actually attentive and interested but their bodies are kind of moving all the time. They, you know, again, they might talk a lot if they're girls. They might be constantly distracting other kids. They might be up out of their seat, sharpening their pencil or getting water or just moving around the classroom, um, blurting things out. So they just are so excited and passionate about what the teacher's talking about that they're, um, you know, constantly, you know, saying the answer to things without raising their hands. Um, at home, you might see them having a hard time, like just sitting down and eating dinner. They're constantly kind of out of their seat when they're not supposed to, interrupting all the time when you're trying to talk about things, talking all the time about whatever their passion or interest is, and kind of not noticing those social cues that you're giving that you want to talk or that you're done with this topic. Um, so those are kind of those hyperactive impulsive symptoms that we might see. Then there's a combined presentation, which is probably the most common diagnosis that we will see in kids with ADHD, which are kids who show a lot of symptoms in both of those areas. Um, so they're kind of impacted with both inattention symptoms and the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Okay. That all makes sense. And I think it's really important for parents who are listening, you know, when you go in and talk more with a professional, they're going to help you parse that out. Um, yeah. Our goal really is to help you think through like, oh, that actually could be a sign or symptom of ADHD. And and you don't have to know yep. like, what presentation your child is, but to give you a little background, and that would probably be in your diagnostic report, one of those types. Yeah. And, it, and as a Yes, you would give one of those types when you're getting getting the evaluation completed by, you know, a pediatrician or a psychologist, they're going to give you a diagnosis. 
um, some parents come back. I know we've we've heard messages from families like, my child is hyperactive though. Um, and part of it is the criteria is very stringent of like, they have to show significant symptoms in like um, multiple symptoms to meet that criteria. So sometimes it is that they are showing some of those symptoms, but it's not the predominant thing that we're seeing, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Across multiple settings. Across multiple settings. Yep. So it's not just that you're seeing at home. It's also that you might be seeing it at school. Sometimes, again, we have kids who are homeschooled Mm -hmm. or some kids, again, like I was saying, they love school and they're super passionate about it. So, and they're people pleasers and they're anxious kids, a lot of our girls. So they might not show a lot of those symptoms, but maybe they're showing them it's soccer practice, or uh, maybe they're showing at grandma's house or, you know, with a babysitter, other types of settings that you might see that in. Let's come back to the diagnoses really quickly. A lot of people, maybe like our age, um, had a diagnosis of ADD, right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and what happened to ADD? Because we get a lot of questions about this, like, no, my child doesn't have ADHD. They have ADD. Yeah. So again, when we make medical diagnoses, we use something called the um, the DSM. And the DSM goes through revisions and changes over the years um, based on changes in our culture and what we learn about diagnoses. And there's kind of a committee that works on that behind the scenes to kind of review current research and make decisions about those diagnoses. So far, they haven't changed the name of ADHD, but (laughs) maybe they will eventually. I don't know. It's been around a long time. So, Um, but again, you know, previously there have been, the ADHD diagnosis has gone through different kind of name changes. And so it used to be just attention deficit disorder back when you know, when we were kids. And so you might have had that diagnosis. That diagnosis has changed now. So we just call all of those presentations ADHD. There's just that predominantly inattentive presentation now. So it's the same, ADD is the same thing as that ADHD predominantly inattentive presentation. Perfect. Yeah, that's a confusing one. Yes, very confusing. Um, Okay, so what age can kids typically get diagnosed with ADHD? That's a question we get a lot. And I'd say most providers are going to be diagnosing ADHD at first around five years old if there are signs that early. Um, In the U.S., ADHD can be diagnosed as early as four, and some providers will do that when the signs are very clear, when there's a very strong family history of ADHD. It makes that diagnosis at the young age um, a little bit easier. In other countries, some countries wait until six years old. So it kind of depends on where you are. Um, But around five years old is when most providers in the U.S. are going to start really looking into that, doing the evaluation. And the tricky thing about diagnosing at such a young age is that a lot of the signs of ADHD are very developmentally appropriate in those early years, very developmentally appropriate for toddlers and preschoolers to have a lot of energy. It's very developmentally appropriate for them to not be able to sit still for Mm -hmm. extended periods of time. It's very developmentally appropriate for them to not be able to follow five step directions. So it's, it's important that if we are doing an evaluation and trying to make a diagnosis at a young age, that we're really teasing that out and saying that, you know, at this point, those signs are not developmentally appropriate or this child is struggling with that much more than we would expect a child of that age, like a lot more aggression or a lot more emotionality. Um, Again, that strong family history. So around five is um, perhaps a little bit earlier in the States, um, perhaps a little bit later in other countries is about when we're going to start um, considering that diagnosis of ADHD. We also um, have a previous podcast episode Um, episode 104, Early Signs of ADHD, where we go into a little bit more detail about what are those very early signs of ADHD that would help us make um, one of those earlier diagnoses. Yeah. And even thinking about in the evaluation process, um, the tools that a pediatrician usually uses, the rating scales are checklists. 
Um, and so those aren't the best measure at a young age, just because like you said, many kids will show those symptoms. However, the testing that I do is um, called standardized testing, where they've done research on what, it, what are the average behaviors and symptoms of a four-year-old across the U.S. and across countries and looking at you know, what is this child's behavior in comparison to that? So we do actually have some tools that can look at, yeah, this does seem to be outside of what is normal for this child at this particular age. That's actually a really good point. And that was actually my next question. So you're giving me such a good segue here about (laughs) who can diagnose ADHD. And that's a great point. Like a little bit, it's going to depend on your individual situation, right? Yeah. And I think that's why pediatricians probably are a little more hesitant um, to give those diagnoses really early on because they might not necessarily have those tools to kind of parse out, is this developmentally appropriate? But but some pediatricians will diagnose as early as four years old. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that you can make that diagnosis um, at that age. So that can happen if you're starting to see concerns early on. Um, if you're looking to get an evaluation done, um, again, pediatricians are usually the pers- first person you're going to go to. Um, and we would say, talk to your pediatrician first and see if they're comfortable with doing that evaluation. If they aren't, um, they're typically going to have referrals for you. Um, I, you know, again, Mallory and I are child psychologists, so you can always find a child psychologist that specializes in um doing evaluations with children and in particular ADHD. Um, There's pros and cons with all those evaluations. Our evaluations tend to be really comprehensive, but expensive. Um, So again, it sort of depends on what your needs are. We go into much more detail if you want to learn more about um, how to find a provider and those pros and cons in a, um, our last episode, episode 115. So go back and check that out. Um, who can diagnose my child with ADHD to learn more about that. And that's going to be linked in the show notes too. So if you're looking for those yeah. episode 104, the early signs or 115, which is which specialists can diagnose, um, those will both be linked there. So for families who are listening and they're thinking, oh my gosh, okay, I think my child maybe does have ADHD, Um, maybe they're waiting for that evaluation or they're just still learning more about ADHD, what can families do kind of in that intermediate time? What should they be doing while they wait for their evaluation? Yeah. And like you said, Katie, they're kind of in this maybe holding pattern, waiting for their evaluation. The best thing I think they can do at that point is to learn more about ADHD Um, I also want you listeners to know if you're in this position that um, you're not doing something wrong, um, that this is not your fault. Normal parenting tools, if your child does have ADHD, may not work for your child. They may not work for you and your family. And that's not because, you know, you're, again, that's not because you're doing something wrong or because your child is bad or naughty. It just comes down to ADHD being a brain-based difference and they need to be parented differently. And a big piece of learning, and we see kind of parents really um, coming to this new level of understanding of their child when they start to learn about executive functioning, especially. And we have a free parenting guide. We talk about executive functioning as well as five other kind of keys to really understanding your child with ADHD or your child who you suspect might have ADHD. Um, It's called Six Keys for Raising a Happy and Independent Child with ADHD. So that is also a great place to start if you're kind of thinking, you know, you're just starting to get into the process of does my child have ADHD or you're waiting for that evaluation. So we'll link that guide um, in the show notes for you as well. I think that's a great place for you to start. Yes. And that education piece is so important, you know, just starting to do research, educating yourself, things like executive functioning. And I know that um, for a lot of families, you know, they're in very different places on their journey. But if you're listening today, then you're taking the time, right? You're listening to a podcast all about ADHD, which it's still called ADHD for now. Um, And so we just, our key takeaway that we really want to leave you with is that you are your child's best advocate. And if you're here listening today, spending your time um, just learning more, you're already doing so much for them. And so just keep on educating yourself so that you can continue to advocate 
for your child. And as always, we are here to support you. Thanks for listening to Shining with ADHD by your hosts, Lori, Katie, and Mallory of the Childhood Collective. If you enjoyed this episode, please like this video and hit subscribe so you can be the first to know when a new episode airs. If you are looking for links and resources mentioned in this episode, you can always find those in the show notes. See you next time.